in the <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll use that as the thumbnail. All right. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our first official like interview episode, so I'm super excited. And uh, I'm also like really grateful for the opportunity to do it with our like co-founder at Startup Studios, Raj, Raj Mavad. Um, so to kind of uh, frame how we met and you know how we kind of came here or came to this point. So we do have an intro episode that we're also putting up under this week at Startup Studios. We kind of talked a little about it, but picture this, right? About mid-2022, I had just, uh, or Delta Leap, we just shut it down. I had, you know, kind of was moving on and kind of trying to figure out what was next. And I decided to be super vulnerable on LinkedIn and just like posting it. And it turns out that Raj and I have some mutual connections who commented on the post or whatever, Raj found me and I had my public calendar on there because I love working with founders. And he was like, hey, I've got a couple of questions. Do you mind if I reach out? And since then, you know, it's been like six, seven months now. We've been working pretty closely together. Uh, I helped out briefly on Thrive and then um, now we just kind of wanted to work together continuously. So uh, Startup Studios was kind of reborn with, uh, with Raj. So I'm super grateful to have you here with me, brother. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome and uh, let, let's get into it. No, I mean, I, I also want to just just take a second and just kind of audit that and, and just be honest about it. Like first, you know, my background is, is it is what it is. But I remember when I came into this tech scene, I was, I was a, you know, internal narrative, a lot of imposter syndrome. And I kind of reached out grasping at straws and someone who comes out the gate being vulnerable and says, hey, listen, I need a mentor or whatever. There's a lot of people who just say mentor hashtag to put that moniker on there. And I remember specifically, I think I even told you this. I had somebody ghost me as a mentor three consecutive times in a row. And that's brutal, man. If you're you're vulnerable and you and you show somebody your vulnerability and you're like, listen, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. And you think you're they're throwing you this rope, and it's realistically, there's it's not attached to anything, and you're grabbing the rope and you're just getting sick. It's brutal. And so you know, I, I want to be really, really clear that that 20 minutes that you gave me, you gave it to me, unequivocally gave it to me on that. And, you know, not too many people go from, hey, here's a random post on LinkedIn to meeting somebody to then continuing to work with them. So, you know, I call it coincidence, call it serendipitous or, or whatever it is. I think it's really cool that, um, you know, that's a testament to you as a person as well and, and why we've done so well together as the back and forth and repartee and, and meeting amazing people. It's like, I think there's some pretty clear, no BS like, approach you take to everything, and it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate that. Well, and, and that's that we're going to be bringing right. Well, well, that's the the startup studios office hours are going to be exactly that too, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we're both going to be offering those and uh, free twenty minute and like paid office hours too for people on like one on one um, like focus time. But anyway, we're gonna dive right in. Um, this is this format is gonna be kind of similar to our guests. It's a little different because it's it's you and I interviewing each other the first two episodes. But once we add a third or fourth like co-founders, it's gonna go a lot more smoothly. So we're gonna dive into it. The first kind of section of the way we're thinking is who is Rajan Wat? So personal, you know, what makes makes you let let's go all the way back to you uh, I know for a fact that you're a Texan boy, but let's get into the nitty gritty. Please. Yeah, man, born and raised. So it's it's funny, you know, It's and I'm sure you'll assimilate the same way, but I'm that brown kid. I'm the brown kid from Texas. You know, we land right off the boat in 83, fleeing a war in the Middle East, and we're first generation here in the States. And you know what do immigrants know? They, they know you can be a lawyer or a doctor, and that was it. So five physicians in my family, mother, father, sister, brother, I actually went to medical school, um, didn't make it through because I knew I didn't want to do it, but I had to kind of do the family business. So, and I did the typical pedigree. My parents didn't know, my parents didn't grow up with parents themselves. They lost them all in the war. And so they did what they could with what they had. While I, I'd love to rest on that, you know, it was hard. It was hard growing up and, and um, you know, first the quintessential prodigal daughter, you know, my sister was born um, right out the gate. She just worked hard. She worked her fingers to the bone because that's what you do. First kid in the immigrant family, you work until your, your, you know, your eyes bleed. My brother, God bless him. He's a Doogie Hauser. The kid's on another level. He's an MD, PhD at you know age twelve, basically. He never opened his backpack. Kid never opened his backpack. He's a savant. 
And we were 11 months apart. So we're Irish twins. Unfortunately, that part, you know, while he was doing Sudoku at age two, you know, even at age 12, I was just farting in a shoebox. Like I, I didn't really know what I was doing with myself. I, I lived under the, the shadow of my older sister, who was number one in her class from sheer grit and hard work. And then my brother, who was number two in his class, just because that's what his gift was. So growing up, I kind of leaned into what I what I thought I could own, which wasn't academics, which was my mouth and 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 my sports. So I kind of was a cut up and I had fun. Um, but that always planted the seed in that narrative of imposter syndrome. It was truly like, I got to work harder because I'm, you know, daddy issues or whatever you want to call it. I, he wasn't proud of me in my own head. And I projected that in everything I did. Um, so I kind of went through school and kind of floated along. Um, and you know, what's interesting stuff, like I floated along where I fit in. So one day in a high school, I, I, I from Texas, I'd be in one little group uh, of the misfits or whatever. And then the next day I might be with the jocks and then the next day I'm, and I fit in where I could. Um, and that was just truly somebody who's just grasping at straws. And I went through that in life. And then I, I kind of went through my professional career, did well on the finance side. So I left, uh, started at Goldman. And when I left, I knew what I wanted to do. And basically I wanted to prove everybody that my dad loved me and that I was, that he was proud of me and, and whatever that meant. So I thought financial success was the only thing that mattered. Um, well, let, let's, let's, uh, you know, before we dive into the Goldman side, I, I, like the high school and the college years, because you yeah. briefly hit on your your um, athletic career, but that's also a big part of who you are. So if we could spend a little it time is. on that. It is, it is. So uh, yeah, I apologize. So I started, um, <laughs> I guess I should do it. So when I went into high school, um, my, my sister started at a, a Catholic prep school. Perfect, quintessential path, you know, Catholic prep school. And, and to kind of to dress it all up, my closest friend and, and the type of caliber of people we had was Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos. So growing up, we were pretty close. And it's like, that was a pedigree of the caliber of people. You know, even in diapers and kindergarten, you're, you're cutting a $20,000 check. And this was just a typical prep Catholic uniform school in Houston, Texas. Um, very affluent area. And again, you know, family of physicians, they did what they they. They had nothing growing up. They ate dirt in Lebanon. So they said, hey, listen, the one thing we're not going to do for our kids is not give them an education. So I went through high school. The problem is it worked out really well for my older brother and sister, like as I mentioned. And I was so close in age and same last name that everybody projected what the Mawad family was onto me. Well, also, and, yeah, I, I don't think we j just one quick note to cut you off, but also both of your parents are physicians. So both your parents and your older siblings. So four out of five. We got like, we are just, we are literally like, if you're not a doctor, what are you? Yeah. Like truly. So we went through this, this whole paradigm of, you want to talk about imposter syndrome. Like you went through this paradigm of, I know what I have to be because that's what love gets you. So high school, I matriculated into, into my freshman year and I realized that I got in and I'm talking like I was a D plus student and that's not like a stretch of imagination It's because I didn't have it. I didn't have it in me. I didn't want to own it. I didn't want to work. And so when I saw what I was up against, i.e. the patriarch and then the true family dynamic of these are brilliant human beings that were diagnosing the dog at dinner and I'm like no he just ate poop like he ate poop and he's throwing up because he ate poop he doesn't have ischemic bowel syndrome because he's a dog I sat there and I was like I don't know what I'm doing so then it got hard academic wise you can kind of skirt through middle school let's be honest here and then it got into high school and I was like what do I do here get into calculus I don't know what calculus is so I actually ended up getting kicked out uh, I got kicked out of three high schools um, and so I just owned it. And, and if I was going to be the black sheep, I was going to be like oil, oil dark. Um, I, I unfortunately had some problems with, you know, self-harm, drinking, all that stuff, because I reached out in a way that I thought my parents would be like, oh, yeah, like my kid, my kid's struggling. Like, here's his cry for help. It didn't pan out the way I wanted it to. So then I just kind of exacerbated that whole situation. So I got to the point where I was like, screw it. I'm on my own. Um, kicked out of that fourth high school. And I was like, man, I got to figure something out. So I got recruited to play football, uh, went to Louisiana and played ball at, at Tulane University in New Orleans um, and, and LSU. But when I was at Tulane, that's one of the first time I fell into something I realized I was pretty good at. And it was actually academics. Um, what was tough was I'd say I was in arrears like uh, two decades. So when you hit this like, threshold, like, OK, like maybe I can think and maybe I can talk and maybe I can be articulate. 
but I've missed 20 years of it. You go into hyperspeed, you go into like overdrive. It's not going 60 miles an hour. You're going 120 because you got to catch up. So I burnt out and I burnt out in a way because I knew what I wanted to do. Um, I, I overachieved. My pendulum was here and then it swung all the way over there. So I got into the, the master's, two of them, quantum math, econometrics. Um, and then when I, right when I left after grad school, you know, but I played ball. I, I continued to play ball, uh, collegiate and professional ball. Um, but I went to medical school just to make my parents happy. And I quit because I knew it was what I wanted to do. And that's when I started my finance side. And but quitting was really, really big deal because you know, that was, that was my lineage. And that was, I finally did something that my parents were like, okay, like he's not as much of a, you let us know if we're cussing in this one or not, but you know, yeah, yeah, no, no, he's, he's not as much as, as a mess up as, as we think he is. And, and so then I started owning that narrative. I was like, okay, my parents are happy with me. And, and again, like, let's just call a spade a spade. And, and Seth, you probably, you, well, maybe you have, I'm not going to project. I'm growing up playing sports every day. I mean, I got a scholarship to play ball and my parents never went to a single practice game anything anything parent teacher cop nothing is what it was you know so you get to the point where uh you take that dynamic internally and you own it and then it manifests and it gets louder and then you don't know what to do with it and later in life you deal with it but in the beginning it was a really really tough person life. and so i think it, it actually kind of formed who i wanted to be on my professional side I said to myself, you know, the first thing I did is I got knuckle tattoos. When I quit going, I was like, I'm not going to have a boss. I'm not going to listen to anybody. And that chip on my shoulders is really big. And I'm going to show you, mom and dad, i.e. the world, that I don't, like, I don't, I can't have my knuckle tattoos. Mm -hmm. Left Goldman after about only about 11 months. Took about 70 grand I had of saved up. Put every penny I had into a hedge fund. Um, I actually had a mentor who had, who had written, he had just finished his third fund. And he kind of held my hand. He's like, hey, man, you, you have a different approach. Um, I did some really, really esoteric, crazy stuff, these derivative models that nobody knew about. And it was uh, it was kind of a competitive advantage because it was so kind of just off the cuff. What was really interesting is it kind of paralleled just the whole paradigm of what business, finance, and what people perceive should be. And by that, I mean, you're Seth and you come to me and you're like, hey, Raj, you run a hedge fund. You know, I, we had four funds. We started our first one only about a million bucks. Um, after about 12 years, we had about a billion two under management with four institutional funds. And we compounded about 613% growth year over year. So I was really, really risky, but my my, my sharp and my Sortino ratios were really high, but we made the ROI that we wanted. And I remember I did this for a reason because I started, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'll be honest and nobody was going to believe me. So I had to prove myself just like I had to prove myself to my parents. So on the fee structure side, we had no management fee, zero, because I said, I'm going to eat when I kill and I'm doing some crazy stuff. Listen to me. So what ended up happening was when I, uh, when we started doing the esoteric stuff, a lot of people will come and be like, so you said, Hey Raj, like you run a hedge fund. Yeah. Okay. You're doing awesome. What do you think about Apple? I got nothing. They're like, well, what, you run a hedge fund. Like, well, yeah. They're like, well, what do you think about Apple or, or Microsoft or, or, or this company? I was like, I have no idea. And they're like, well, aren't you a finance guy? You're a CFA. You know, I got a CFA. Uh, they're like, well, like you should know this stuff. I was like, why? They're like, you're running hedge. I was like, no, I run FX derivatives. I don't run. I don't, I don't care about stocks. And I'll tell you why, because I think at that point, and this is how I kind of formed my personal career, personal life formed my professional career. I didn't trust anybody. Period. Perfect example. When Elon Musk tweeted, funding secured at 420, that's a CEO lying about his company. So anybody can talk they at a, any side of their mouth. And then, you know, the reality comes into play. So what I always used to tell myself is debt never lies. Debt never lies. Um, Seth, you say that you're really, really healthy, but... The hospital knows what your real blood, you know, what your blood looks like, your cholesterol, whatnot. And you know who else does? Your health insurance premium. Hey, are you, do you have a really low health insurance premium because you're healthy? No, Seth has a really, really high one because he's not healthy. And that's when I put debt. And by debt, I'm saying, hey, you know, bonds or whatever debt structure that this company was doing. For me, I don't care what the CEO said. If the debt was trading at a much higher multiple or really, really high interest because you're paying through the nose because they were very questionable with the insolvency, to me, that's truth. Not whatever the CEO is saying. It's what the underlying things are saying. 
So take that narrative and remove it and put it into how I took my business career in general. So I never trusted anybody. I never looked at firsthand data. I did my own due diligence in anything and everything under the sun. And that's how I formulated kind of my professional career. And candidly, after that, when I saw the efficacy of me doing my own due diligence, doing my own, you know, dirt, I said, this is how you, should, well, not you, this is how I wanted to build my businesses. I've always said from day one, like, there are people who call others to do dirt, and there are people who just do dirt. Um, and I think that's kind of how I want to move forward in my life. I think it's really important for me to honor that and be, hey, man, like startups or companies or whatever, you got to put in the work. It's really easy to take third party and second party, you know, research papers and do blah, 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 blah. But the reality is if I'm looking at arbitrage and real, real ROIs on investments, that's on me. Perfect example. Another one, when it comes to like some of the crazy, stupid stuff I would do, it's talking about um, just consumer goods. Great. Awesome. Everything's going well. Holiday season's coming up. You tell me that, hey, we did our sales of here and you're just talking Tesla. Again, I'm, I'm not picking on that, but for fun. To me, instead of listening to what a CEO said, I'm going to go look at core data boxes. I'm literally going to go, which are shipping packages. I'm going to go see 80% year over year margins are down during this holiday season because nobody's spending shit. I know for a fact if core data boxes aren't going out the door for shipping, consumer products aren't going out the door for shipping. So I don't care what a CEO says. I look at the underlying commodity, oil, pro you know, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think that's what got me so excited about moving forward past my professional career into kind of this mentor startup, you know, ecosystem, because it's really important to know what you don't know, and then do your own due diligence and do your own dirt. And that's kind of how I think what's why startup studios is so cool. It's like, cool, we can think and talk and pontificate. But if you don't sit there and really start looking at what you want to do, man, nobody's going to hold your hand. Nobody's going to hold you. I'm going to get, I'm going to get, if you're in a hole, I'll get in the hole with you. I will literally get in the hole with you because I know how to get out. You see those, those nail markings on the side with the blood. Those are mine. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw you a rope. I'm going to come in there and I'm getting there with you. We'll do some dirt together and we'll show you the way and we'll see if you want to stand on some stuff and work. But kind of how I set up the accelerator. So Matt Hatter um, was more like, listen, Matt Hatter wasn't something I, I was taught. I went through 17 months of ideation and pain that I turned into you know, a curriculum. And I think what's really important, and, and you do the same way, is we repurpose assets. And by assets, it can be experiences, thought processes, ideation, what we go through. Those aren't sunk costs. Those are assets that we can use to, to learn from and teach people through. So I think that's why I think I'm really excited about what startup studios could be um, and will be. It's more important like, hey, this is kind of how I want to own my own narrative and be a, a value add throughout the entire ecosystem. No, that's that's amazing. Thank you so much. So we we kind of jumped across a few different things. Like so so going back to post uh, the fund, um, I yeah. think you you briefly kind of hit honed on on that. Where um, I, I don't know if you want to talk about like what happened with the fund and oh. then what how you know you kind of segued in what you're doing now because that that's also an amazing story. Brutal, brutal. <laughs> so I started and 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 I think actually. Yeah, that I probably should be very, very up, you know, very specific to that. Not about it being upfront about it, because I'm extremely upfront about it, but more importantly, why I'm doing what I'm doing now. So 06, um, again, I think I was probably like 20 nothing. Um, nothing in my pocket and just naivete and open eyes. I, I didn't know about consequences. I talked to my mentor. I said, hey, this is what I want to do. He's like, Raj, you're in it. Just do this, 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 and this. It's like, cool. I spent, you know, 76 grand doing this, 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 and this. I set up everything the right way. Auditors, accountants, administrators, um, hedge fund, SEC. The, the fund, the uh, hedge fund. Okay. Yep. So when I'm doing, when you're trading outside people's money, this wasn't my personal money. These weren't my money. These are credit investors. These are very, very regulated you know, issuances. So I set up my very, very first fund. I had four subsequent funds, but my friends and family fund, I set up all the right way, but... Candidly, I didn't know what I was doing, if I'm just being radically transparent. I thought I did. I thought I paid the people to do it the right way. Um, did great. So uh, uh, again, 11 years in, we had four subsequent funds, institutional funds. I'm talking pensions, Utimco, Texas Teachers Fund, CalPERS, um, $250 million on fund. We had billionaires in these funds. Um, most people know October of, well, maybe they don't, October, I remember the day, October 24th, 2011, uh, MF Global, 
MF Global was a giant institutional brokerage shop that went bankrupt. So John Corzine, very much like what just happened to FTX, commingled assets when they weren't supposed to. Um, John Corzine, which was economic guy and now he's a politician and has another hundred hedge fund, of course, commingled assets, SEG40 assets. So SEG40 assets completely removed. Our money should not have been touched with corporate monies. 100% illegal. Um, got commingled, they invested assets and they blew up. So there was a BK, there was a, a, a bankruptcy and $472 million of our fund was locked up. What that did is it triggered a huge audit. Um, by 2015, we had the NFA, which is National Futures Association, the CFTC and the SEC in my office being like, hey, listen, your very first fund set up in 2006 didn't cross this T and dot this I. Your other four funds were great. Don't worry about it. But when you were an idiot, when you were 20, you didn't do it this way. I was like, oh. Okay, and and they're like, oh yeah, you're you're done, you're fined, you're banned, uh, you need to do this. So I was like, wow, oh, it's brutal. And and let's take let's take a, another step back. I was chairing galas. I was you know on the board of Teach for America. My parents had names on buildings, and I was now in the newspaper saying, hey, fraud, 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 fraud. So it hurt. And if you want to talk about imposter syndrome <laughs> with a megaphone <laughs> and it was perfect it was raj you, you you're not your brother you're not a doctor you're not this and then you know 31 years later it was like comes full circle like yep all that stuff you're saying for 31 years makes a lot of sense so i owned it i owned it for a while so 15 happened um but i knew i knew for a fact what we did was right we never did anything nefarious we just fucked up we just messed up. I didn't know what I was doing when I was 20. We missed one thing. The other four subsequent funds, you know, I I hired the CEOs, CFOs at that point. I had all the gray hairs and all the suits at that point, but the first one didn't work. Huge audit. Um, what was funny was I remember specifically that I paid the taxes of all of my LPs that got that got closed up in at MF Global. So before we got the bankruptcy, before we had the, our huge fine and our fraud uh, allegations. When MF Global happened, which I thought was hilarious, was we still had to pay taxes on unrealized gains. What do I mean by that? So your Ceph in 2011, before the bankruptcy, you gave Raj, you gave RNS Capital a dollar. And I turned that dollar into $10. And in the end of the year, you owe taxes on the $9 that you made in money. But all $10 were locked up in a bankruptcy file. So how are you going to pay $9 that you didn't have, the, you know, the tax on that? I personally paid that for all of my LPs, um, right or wrong, because that's what happened. Uh, and, and you know, I did have a, a billionaire come in. He loaned me 78 cents on the dollar so I could kept going, which was great. No interest or anything like that. He says, Raj, I know what you're going through. I've seen everything. I've done the audit on you. I know you're doing it right. Stay alive. And I did. I stayed alive and I subsequently flourished after that. So, you know, God bless him name will be left out. Um, but but these are people who really understood what you're going through. Not only that, you know, we had a big problem. So in 15, going into 16, that happened. For seven years, I sat there. I sat there and they're like, hey, listen, you can settle, you can do this, you can blah, 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 and just be done with it. I said, no, I'm not going to do that because we didn't do anything wrong, period. Um, so seven years later, we had a huge, and this is going through court systems, I moved uh, states, so it had to go through another court system. Then COVID happened, three years gap. All these things happened. Uh, August of 2022, finally get the Department of Justice, the CFTC, and the SEC to say, hey, you did nothing wrong. We are dismissing, voluntarily dismissing your entire case. So seven years of pain, seven years of my family looking at me being like, you idiot. All, all the friends gone, all the things, all the things to deal with um, in one piece of paper gone after, you know. But what's funny is, again, seven years before, plastered on everything. Oh, this, this, you know, probably like, probably just like FTX. Imagine seven years from now, if FTX was like, actually, you didn't do anything wrong. We're stupid. And nobody's going to ever hear about it. It wasn't for anybody. It was for me. It was for me to put my head to bed at night and just like, cool. I think what's really important from that is, Life sucks. And, and, and I'm not going to pretend to sit here. Oh, it's the best thing that ever happened. No, no, it's a straight lie. It sucked upside down cake. It did. 
And I think that's really important for me to, if we want to go into whatever, you know, higher power it is, it's really important for me to honor that and be like, listen, things can go squirrely really quick, right or wrong. They can go squirrely really quick. What are you going to do about it? You got to quit and run and then all the things. So I think that's, what's really important as founders and startups and whatnot to understand you can do everything right and still get shot in the foot. Um, but that's okay. You have the right network around you. And, and I think even when you and I talk, you, you've never, ever, ever even thought, even before the dismissal, let's be really honest, man, it was nothing. It was, hey, Raj, shut up and get out of your own way. Cool, let's go to work. And having that that person behind you, that network behind you, dude, you didn't know me my whole life. I had people cut and run after 31 years of friendship, literally cut and run. Funny enough, you know, after 24 years of friendship, when I cut a $250,000 check to be the chair of a gal at Teacher America, they're all calling me being like, hey, man, what are you doing next week? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then the negative stuff comes out and they don't even pick up the phone. So that's life, you know, and I'm sure you have your story and we'll get into it. But I think it's really important to take that, move it forward through the, through the, through it all and see what we can build using that as a foundation. Absolutely. Um, uh, and thank you for, for all that detail too. So of note, um, as we mentioned, so when you and I first connected, um, you know, it, it was with the intention of working a little more closely together. So I had to do my due diligence and it was like, I think the third or fourth page of Google, right? Where there were like two or three links about that old court case about RNS mm -hmm. Capital. And you had, you had already kind of told me like, Hey, if you're going to look up RNS Capital, there's some, you know, some stuff happened, but I'm a current fighting it and I'm close to winning. So um, just take that as for what it is. So I just, you know, I, I kind of kept that in a bucket. I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's get to know one another. Let's spend, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever going back and forth. And, you know, I, I've worked with enough people to where I, I trust my gut when it comes to different people. Right. So um, in yeah. your case, and I, I told you that too, like, I was always going to ask you about it later on, but because you were also transparent with me about it up front, uh, maybe not in detail, but you know, it, it was it was a good or a nice enough gesture to where I was like, okay, it's not that big of a deal for now. And especially when you know uh, to to kind of uh, just one last point about this, like when you come to me or when we met and you're talking about like, yeah, I uh, you know, one point eight billion under management and a fund, and then all of a sudden like, oh, there was fraud allegations. They, it becomes a pretty kind of like a pretty big red flag so i completely understand where you're coming from but uh, and and this we'll probably talk about in the future as well with some other people but let's say for example when you and i were working together there were a couple of people that you induced me to who within like not even two or three minutes of of talking to me already made up their mind right like um oh he's got failures in his past and blah blah so it, it happens and I, I completely understand but the way you came out of that so now now we're going back to when you know, you're, you're dealing with friends, you're dealing with family, you're going through this kind of rebuild. And at this point, you were with Stephanie, with your wife? Or... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So so kind of like from here now to uh, kind of the rise of the phoenix, let's say. Uh, let, let's get into that. Yeah. And she had she had the worst of it all, to be completely transparent. And, and I do want to hash on one thing, because I, I, I think it's a testament to you and your background, when we, which will be next. It's you know, you did say that. I remember specifically, first, you kept har harping on these 50 questions for founders, which I think we should still do, which I love. And I think everybody should do it because it's interesting. There were some questions in there that were like, hey, when you're stressed as a founder, what are you going to do or not do? And so the co-founder with you has to be like, oh, shit, I know when Raj gets stressed, he starts drinking or, or starts playing fiddle faddle or whatever. So, you know, this is a part of him. This is a part of him. And it goes into like love. Like, I know that Seth snores at, at night. But I love Seth for Steph, and I'll deal with Seth and his snoring. So I think what was really great is you did know, and you kept saying, hey, we'll talk about that. You kept saying, you kept, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I was like, really? Like, that's not the first thing you want to know about. So I think it's really interesting. But, you know, back to Steph, I think that was really an interesting point. She got the worst of everything. She actually got the worst of everything. When I met Steph, I was like at the zenith. I was at just the, the top. I was, you know, stupid penthouses in New York and Bob Bentley's and private plane. And when I met Steph and we went through it, um, Steph was sitting there with me at CarMax. She was sitting with me at CarMax selling Mercedes with me. She was literally sitting with me at CarMax selling Mercedes. That's what she had to deal with. She had to sit there and sell cars with me, man. 
she missed everything and 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 then she what she caught was the flack she caught the family dynamic she caught the friends giving me middle fingers she caught all the stuff and then not just me her family dude her family her uncle was in the um, finance industry and you know her her cousins are brilliant human beings and entrepreneurs and they're not dumb they're not dumb they see this stuff and then i had a then i started drinking bad really really bad and 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 self-medicating and you know she 36 days of inpatient you know rehab and stuff and yeah the phoenix didn't rise for a while i'm not even gonna lie and it's still going and we had to leave almost physically leave the the city and and we moved and it was much better and she's never wavered it's pathetic how much i i i you know leaned into to that and it's been hard it's not been easy in any way shape or form we have two you know amazing kids but it wasn't something that was easy and and she dealt with all that and she's seen my iterations and it's hard too because you know I haven't had a real stable job since if I'm being honest you know I've always kind of stayed in the startup place and maybe you know you, you know how it goes and that's hard that's hard for a significant other and you know it's even funnier and and it's not funny in any way shape or form I always talk um Candy, I'm not a huge fan of these big corporates. If if you're if you have some arbitrary metric that you want to hit as 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 a, a KPI for the quarter because you have some shareholders and you miss it, and then that's your warrant for shedding ten thousand people. Like I, I, it's really hard for me to buy into that mentality. Guess whose insurance we've been on for the past five years? Like enough, Rosh. Like let's just call a spade a spade. Guess whose insurance we've been on for the past five years? So, you know, she's, she's been, she's battle tested. She's, I would never tell that to her face, but she is, I'm kidding. Um, She's, she's a tough kid, but you know, you know what it goes. You know how it goes. You probably went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's amazing. And and, uh, that's perspective too, right? Like most people don't really see or, or hear about like what it takes when you kind of get knocked down. And especially in, in such a fast pace and in such a, a high stress environment or, or business, like, you know, you, you like, I, I'm, you, you kind of glossed over it where you had a, a billionaire friend who kind of helped you, um, you know, at times when things were, went wrong. And despite his help, like things still went wrong. And yep. thankfully he or she is still, so backing you, but all of that, right. You, it, it's kind of weird how you kind of, out of hundreds of people, now all of a sudden you're down to like a couple who really yeah. understand you or who really got your back. And then everybody else on the outside, even if they, they're they still acting cool with you, they can still kind of, you know, talk uh, behind your back or, or kind of still rum around. And it, it does and hurt on top of the family and, and all that does. It does. I did think I looked, uh, I lucked out because I have, and I think this is why I knew I was doing it right. That's why I never settled. That's why I always fought it, even though it was extremely expensive and didn't do anything for me, to be honest. Um, when I, you know, two text messages and, I, and every investor I want will be right back into another company, which is great. I mean, I think that's why, like, I, like again, I think I know who I am, what we did with them. My fund now, you know, Thrive now, you know, two old investors, like, I don't even care what you're saying. Here's my money. Like, and they went through, they went through all of it because that's what we did. We sat there and we, and we did it. But I mean, it takes two to tango, man. Yeah. No, and, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna actually, uh, you know, because again, whenever you, uh, even right now, and we talked about this, I'm going to help you out with it, where, uh, you send me a picture of the, uh, of the appeal uh, going through, uh, and you winning. Um, but that's not everywhere else. Like, there's the, none of the courts or anything are gonna update it and be like, "No, it's wrong, or whatever." Nope. So we're we're gonna that's do our job. Wipe my ass with. Yeah. We're gonna we're we're gonna highlight it uh, everywhere and as much as we can. So, um, but so, okay. Now, like, let's. Things are difficult. You said you moved from Houston um, to Seattle, and. Now you're kind of going back to your roots, which is into maybe, um, you know, the athletics, into fitness and and kind of, you know, we're, we're bridging the gap now to, to yeah. thrive. So let's dive into that, please. Well, what about you, dude? No, no, well, so, mine's going to come next episode. So don't worry. I'm going to go. Oh, your next episode. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this entire thing is, de- is de- uh, devoted to you, bro. 
<laughs> oh man. All right, cool. So I took a step back and I realized, so let, let's, I'm still a businessman at heart. Like just completely honest. Now I have an altruistic idea on everything I want to do in life. Altruism is great, but doesn't move anybody's needle. So you have to show financial ROI to get your altruism. So I said to myself, like, what do I want to do? I've, I've seen families of physicians. I've seen burnout. I've seen all this stuff. Um, and you know what? And, and it's funny because surrounding myself with people like you and those that were going to bring in the startup studios ecosystem, you listen. You listen and you hear me. I think that's really hard. I think as a founder, being listened to is great. But there's always somebody who's listening who's ready to talk. Either like you're sleeping or you're high or something, but like you listen and you hear, which I think is really interesting. And you put it so succinctly. And when we were talking to tech stars in our last interview is you saw my IB hat and my IB hat saw the opportunity in a frenetic antiquated system and industry like health and wellness, not, you know, healthcare, medical, but like more like fitness, true fitness. And I think once I said to myself, Hey, listen, I know I can build a company with my passion of health and wellness. And you saw that like, it wasn't just a company, but you can use your skill set and business and, 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 and that type of uh, iteration into health and wellness. And so that's kind of like, which was a great bridge of between the two. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, once we left and, and kind of got my feet settled, um, I'd, I'd stayed in on the wellness side. So kind of got into gyms, building gyms and, 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 and all that stuff. And, you know, I had a brick and mortar and that was great. I said to myself, I, I like to build with scale. Uh, that's really, if I'm going to do something and that's just me in a nutshell, I think that's what we're going to bring all the people in the startup studio and, and you yourself. Like, I, I don't think either of us is, is okay with it. Just like you didn't build a VC fund for no reason or to keep it small. Like, and I don't know if it's ego or pride or hubris. I don't think so, but I want to build big and not with my name. And I, you know, what's great is I asked you specifically could do VC again. You're like, yep, but don't fucking know my name. I don't want to be anything. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to de-identify <laughs> the fund and just be like, fund one. <laughs> you don't know who's running or whatever. Here's the money because you don't want people to know it's you. And I think that's like now we've gotten to the point where we don't care. It's not about, you know, we want to do the right thing and win. Maybe I'm still competitive at heart. I'm sure you are too. But it's not like for a reason for people to know that you won. It's like for me to know that I won. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, okay, um, I have a passion for health and wellness. And I know I can kind of morph that and transition and bridge the gap between health and wellness into building a business. So what really happened was kind of fun. I said, I started building out a movement pattern that was for my mom. My mom was realistically the person um, who I built everything for. And the juxtaposition is as much as we didn't get along growing up, you know, um, she's always at the core of a lot of stuff that I do, just completely transparent. Mm -hmm. So my mom's is, is could never really get to get a mom. And it's funny too, because mom, dad, and sister and brother, you're like, oh man, they're doing so well. You know who the, the unhappiest people in the world are? My mom, dad, and sister, brother. They work their fingers to the bone and, and they're just so disenfranchised at what they do. And life, because they don't take care of themselves. They always put themselves last. It's mind-blowing that healthcare professionals are like, health and wellness, except for my own. So, you know, seeing them kind of dredge through the mud, mom had three laminectomies, dad had another one as well. He wears a 35 pound weight vest as a radiologist all day long. Sister got in a wreck after a 72 hour call shift. Like at some point you just have to be like, you, you're just going to burn out. And we saw that being pervasive. Don't worry about COVID, even pre-COVID, just, it was brutal. The healthcare system just burned out. I sat there, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, what's the point of this? What's the point of this? And honestly, man, if we just want to call it, like call it out. Cool. So you have another house in a different country. Mm. I know for a fact there's some houses my we only we've never stepped foot in them. Like, what's the point, man? What's the point? So you know, kind of, and and that's I think, to be honest, I had to go through the up and the massive down to realize, yeah, even at the up, I still had a hole. I still had a massive hole here. The up, when the highs were eh, and the lows were low. You got, you got, you got to audit. You got to audit. Be like, hold on, what's up? What are my highs? Why are they not really there? Why am I low so bad? So I took a step back and like, man, I'm just, I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it for me. And so I said, cool. What do I love? I love my mom. I love health and wellness. I want people to be happy. I want people to move. I want people to sit and drink and, and sleep all day long in their bed. I don't want them to be lethargic or this depressive state. So let's move. Action cures all, right? So I started kind of building out about two and a half years ago, actually almost three and a half years ago, built out a movement pattern. 
Um, oh man. So I actually, I had a back in the day, oh man, about four, almost five years ago now, had a business partner in uh, a brick and mortar and I met him and wow, he'd been doing it for 23 years. He had three studios that turned into one that was in the red bad. And he just was a terrible businessman. He had a massive salary for himself. He couldn't hit payroll a lot of times. He would, you know, debt finance the fund just so he could say, hey, listen, I'm X, Y, and Z. And you sit here and you're like, what are you doing? So I said, hey, man, listen, I'm going to help out because I love what you're doing. I know this is going to work, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> um, we had a deal to, for me to, so after about three, three months in one of them, um, it went from red to black and almost a 2x black. We opened a second one immediately out the gate black, opened a third one out the gate black. Say, listen, I want to buy it. I'll buy it from you at X level. Two days before we enacted the MSA, he reneged. And I was just like, yeah, sounds about right. So just, again, just one more thing of like, really? Like, really? Built it from scratch, like from scratch. Turned into a cash cow. He's like, no, I'm going to keep it. Sounds about right. So then that's, again, that's when I went back to like my roots of like, I'm, it's me. It's me and that's it. So um, built out a movement pattern that I knew I had a product that was great and that I wanted to build a business around. I took the, the movement pattern with a uh, a gentleman and he, had, he hadn't been able to move for, he was 55. He, he was about a hundred pounds overweight. He had bilateral hip replacements after a bad wreck. He said he was a little bit more high touch. So we couldn't get healthy. After about um, three months with me, 90 days, he had lost 55 pounds. I don't know. I wish I was like, oh man, we crush it. We didn't. We found something for him that worked. Yeah. Literally, that was it. And that's why people are like, you know, what, what, what diet should I do? The diet that fits your lifestyle. Shut the, like, stop it. Just stop. Nobody's better than the other person. Be best for you. I don't care about keto. And again, I'm being metaphorical. But I'm not care about keto. I'm not care about intermittent fasting. Blah, 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 blah. I don't give a shit. If it works for your lifestyle, that's the diet you should be on. So for this person, I, I'm not saying we were the best, you know, whatever. For his lifestyle of non-impact, globalistic, you know, stuff on his joints, he couldn't do it. But the proprioception, the modalities that we built out, were so perfect for him. He was like, damn, dude, like this works really well. Uh, iterated a little bit on it. And like, you know, it, it works for 88% of the demographics. And I said, cool. So we have some scalable product. Like I want to build a business. Not by sheer happenstance. He was a builder. And I was like, hey man, like I know he built a Kirkland downtown, which is this beautiful, like basically gold standard. And I was lucky. Um, Seth, I, I never exploit relationships, but I will leverage them. If 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 it's a win-win for everybody and I can add value, I don't think I'm exploiting them. I'm obviously adding value. I said, hey man, Mr. X, I know you built here. I have an idea of doing this, this, and this. He goes, Raj, brilliant. Let me make you the intro. You go do it. And it worked and it hit. And basically the premise was, I'm Seth. I'm moving from the Bay Area to New York or to Seattle for Facebook. They put you in some temporary, in some housing or whatever. Floor to ceiling glass, floor to ceiling glass. Five grand a month rent, five grand a month rent. Valet, you valet. Two times a week, personal training baked into your rent. But hold on, what you say? <laughs> Went through a whole thing, built out an app, whole system. Um, you know, within about, man, I'd say we we're going into 19. We were kicking off about 70 grand a quarter in, in, in gross uh, net profits, which was great. You know, it was working well. And I said to myself, I love this, but I know there's going to have to be some scale to this. And the scale was, I don't want to own assets. I'm a low, I'm a high margin, low, you know, low asset kind of guy. Cash flow is king and I want to be, I'm lean. So I said, I don't want brick and mortars. I don't want everything. I don't want that. So I said, well, how can we scale what we have through technology? Um, and that's when the true imposter syndrome comes in. I'm <laughs> not a technical founder. I didn't go to MIT. I played college ball and just look at me in general. Like, let's just call it space, <laughs> baby. So I was like, cool, I can build an app. <laughs> so I said, okay, here's the premise of the business. How can we turn this business into a scalable, you know, technology platform? And that's how Thrive kind of came from the Next Level Finish, which was our first iteration. So brick and mortar, uh, we had, we ended up having about a seven, uh, 11 in the end uh, groups that we worked with. And I'm, I'm pretty strategic when I approach certain things, when I, in verticals and go to markets, a lot of it's strategic partnerships. Because I know for a fact, if somebody's already doing it, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So we started with our brick and mortars. The first thing we did, this builder built for um, a, a, 
obviously Google, which was in, in downtown Kirkland. And it was like, great, that's a great, great first group. Um, the very next building next to them that was being sold by Google was bought by a giant REIT, Avalon Bay. And Avalon Bay Communities is probably the largest, one of the larger REITs in, in the U.S., commercial REITs in the U.S., top 10. I said to myself, cool, what's a better distribution channel and a better partner than one of the largest REITs in the U.S.? So I went straight to them as my first one. I didn't do that, I mean, tactically, because let's be honest, if we're in a, if, if we're in a startup and we're thinking to ourselves, who's a good strategic partner? It's probably one who could be an exit in the end. Like just, just be radically transparent. I knew for a fact they had some programs they were trying to lean into. They're trying to make the community engagement. So I said, hey, listen, a $40 billion read might be a good partner to start with. And that might be a good exit strategy down there. So that's how we had it started. And then, you know, the SaaS solution, the startup had a tech platform that was basically doing what we did, uh, bringing people directly to your home based on your personality, do a specific movement pattern. But it was more of a tech platform now. That start one one of twenty twenty is when we re rolled out. Yep, rolled out Thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, three twenty of twenty twenty, March of twenty twenty, everything comes to a halt. COVID hits hard. Um, there's an interesting part on that, but I'll, I'll keep going real quick. Um, I'm a creature of history. I love history. <clears throat> COVID happens. Everything shuts down. Every gym shuts down. Everybody's working from home. Everybody's kids at home. I was like, well, that's interesting. What did we have? We didn't have any brick and mortars. We didn't have any big box gyms. And we were already in the apartment complexes. Now, Seth is not going to the office. He's working from home. Oh, there's my gym. Oh, Seth's kids are there. I hate my kids. I'm going crazy. I need an escape. We went from 11 partners to 37 um, with a 22% adoption rate because everyone was working from home and we were allowed to continue to use the apartment complex. Houses. And and this adoption rate, just um, uh, to clarify, these were tenants of the apartment buildings that you partnered with, 22% of all those tenants signed up for your sessions. That's so amazing. The first one was 4,700 doors, 22% of them. But I also kind of had two iterations because I knew we were a continuum of care. I knew for a fact what I wanted to do, the movement patterns were working. I also did another thing, um, creature habit. And, and I think this is what we can all bring to startup studios is I think you and I specifically don't have a burden of knowledge because our egos don't let us have one. I don't have this hammer and everything's a nail because I don't even know what's in my hand. I don't even know a hammer. I don't know how to spell hammer. That's how much I've messed up. So there's no way that everything's a nail. I'm not that good to hit everything with this. So I said, what don't I know? I did so much due diligence on the Spanish flu. Um, hey, you know, that shut everything down in 1918. So what happened in 1918 that we can take for COVID? Healthcare systems stayed open. Necessities. So, okay, what's a healthcare system that I could maybe leverage for health and wellness that's going to stay open? PT clinics. So we actually partnered with PT clinics as almost gyms because we knew they would be open. We use their facilities. And that was another distribution channel for Thrive to stay above. So all these people had these, all these health and wellness guys had mortality events during COVID. And we went the opposite direction because we looked past here and we didn't say, hey, I'm going to screw the man. I'm going to keep my doors open. I'm going to take those fines. And I don't care because man, politics and red versus blue or stick. Who cares? Like this is, I think I lost that ego so long ago that I'm too old to fight and, and care enough to be like, let me piss vinegar. I'm like, cool. Like this is a situation. I know I can iterate and be better than the next person because they're going to sit there in this, this, this stasis. And if we can just make some action. And so like PT clinics, chiro clinics, apartment complexes, and we mushroom, we mushroom. So you know, I think that's something that's really important to understand is that while there's trials and tribulations, there's there's no there's no finality in anything. That's what's so nice about what we can do. Um, so, you know, that's when Thrive really kind of started taking off. Uh, fast forward a year, man, going on two now. We've gotten more partners than, you know, through the same modalities. Um, and, you know, we're moving more from a SaaS solution into a little bit in health tech and insure tech play. But the reality is I had a passion and an altruism of, of my mom and dad and getting them healthy and wealthy and wise. And then I had to start with a financial ROI. So I started with healthcare systems. I started with apartment complexes. I mean, and now you get to the point where 
if you can show that financial ROI, it gives you runway. It not only gives you runway and leeway, it also gives you internal cheerleaders. So, you know, these property managers and all these leasing agents, and, and, and let's call a spade a spade here. I walked into these apartments at four in the morning and started talking, you know, to people. And then at 8 a.m., after I trained all the clients, I talked to the leasing agent. And I literally went downstairs and I talked to the person at the front desk. Hey, I'm Raj. Hey, I'm, I'm Susan. Nice to meet you, Susan. Um, you know, is this, well, no, I'm, I'm just a, con oh, you're not just a concierge. You're not at all. I'll see you tomorrow, Susan. So okay. I'll Susan the next day. Hey, Susan. Hey, Raj, what's up? Oh, nothing. Here's your coffee. Cool. Thanks, Raj. Cool. So I'll Susan the next day. Hey, Raj, have you met Jeff, our, our leasing manager? No. Hey, Jeff, I'm Raj. Cool. Hey, Jeff, what's up? Hey, Jeff, here's your call. Three months later. Hey, Jeff. Hey, uh, Raj, this is our community manager. It's actually our regional manager. They got a new promotion. You should talk to him about see what you can do to thrive. Blah, 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 blah. It, it, it's not, it's, it's dirt. It's dirt. It's kissing babies and doing dirt. And, and, you know, billion to nothing. It doesn't matter. You still have to go do the dirt. So it was, it was sweat equity. No question. You know, I was in there. I didn't, I testament to Steph, you know, didn't see the kids in the morning, didn't see them at night sometimes. And, you know, I got to the point that wasn't sustainable and, and you figured it out, but you do it the right way when you can. And, and that's how you do it. And if you do it through, if it's giving, you know, from the right place and it's without an expectation, it's true. And I think that's how you are as a person. Like, I think you give without expectation and that's why you and I have been come so close. And, so, and I think we're going to be extremely successful when we do it. There's no, there's no side, there's no side game. There's no side anything. It's like, cool, we'll monetize it because we need to, but we're going to do it the right way. You're going to know exactly how we're going to do it. All our incentives are going to be aligned. And I think everybody wins at that point. So, you know, when Thrive started showing this, hey, the PMs win, the property managers win, the client wins, the provider wins. Man, when we built out like the geolocation, I mean, I, I you know, we saw the stats, the bookings, the incremental bookings of these people who didn't know how to book a business, these providers who are like, oh man, I didn't have a single client today. Now I have 14 at the static book of business and I'm driving around. Everybody wins. We pulled our FOB swipe, our FOB analytics swipes of gyms. Um, we, I think we went from like, our average was seven swipes a day, you know, seven swipes to 44. And they're like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, we're listening to your patrons and we're empowering them to go use what they want to use, not what you think they would use. Mm -hmm. So once you see the PMs, you know, tenant lease churn lower, you know, NOI accretive higher, higher rent, huh? everybody's winning. Uh, I, you know, there's going to be <clears throat> pitfalls. There's going to be back and forth, you know. I negotiated some certain things. I'm sure that's going to change. So we don't have like rev shares. So let's, if, if we're calling a spade a spade here, I go in, our providers go in, they use the the, the facilities place for free. Um, they charge the client whatever they want and the facility doesn't make any money on it. But tenant amenity, value add, accretive on all different aspects. I'm sure down the road, once they start seeing those FOB analytics, they're like, let me do that math if it's x amount of dollars a session and there's swipe oh my god like they're just <laughs> that's just flowing through our place and so then again it begets another thing we started talking to them about hey listen you should do this this and this you replace your your three-story rock wall that literally didn't have a single chalk mark on it because nobody's ever used it why don't you pull that down and put in some pilates reformers with some streaming classes that people couldn't start doing because that's revenue generating so you know their dead space started being utilized and everybody started to win but i think that's how you have to build you know you have to build giving it first and you figure it out. And two-sided marketplaces, as you know, are just brutal. They're just brutal. So mm -hmm. I think that's why Thrive has been able to really sustain itself and grow. It's because it took a long arc. It took a long story arc. It wasn't a unicorn in a day. It was like, shit, man, I'm like, uh, all right, this, I got to go back into this place. I got And it was me. It was me, truly, being honest. You know, some great people on the team now, but reality, it was just sweat equity and just eating, eating crow and just doing the dirt. And also just knowing like, I live in squalor. <laughs> I mean, I do. I mean, I, 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 I don't spend any money. I just don't. I don't need to, which is great. I don't. I've gotten past the ego of stuff. Um, and again, I don't know why I said ego, but I've gotten past stuff. So I'm lucky that I have two good kids that are happy and healthy. And and again, obviously, it's clear that Steph has that amazing insurance. But you know, my our overhead is extremely low. Um, and again, I think I had to go through. Cool, here's your Bentley in, in <laughs> oh God. I was literally punching it. I was punching and kicking it one night. And that was just me at that time. You know, you have everything and you're just punching and kicking a Bentley. And I'm like, not to say that I had one, I was like, it doesn't, who gives a shit? I'm still an ugly POS, but it's like, you know, it, it brought me nothing. It made me, it actually, honestly, I take that back. It brought me way, 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 way down. Um, 
and again, if I'm just being honest, it was that was the relationship that that was the opportunity cost with my my father. The opportunity cost with my father, who worked his finger to the bone to get stuff. And then when I got stuff, obviously I'm being very generic with stuff. I was like, that? Like that, that's why you didn't come to our games? Like for for this stupid thing that I'm punching and kicking? Obviously, I'm projecting, but it was it was brutal. Yeah. And so, you know, I maybe I had the privilege to get to that point. I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh I I'll call that out as well. But yeah, I got to the point now where I'm I have now it's really interesting. And, I, and I'll be honest, it was working with you and some guys on the team now, you know, six a year in, I have a very, very, well, actually more, I have a goal, but I have a focus. Yeah. And to me, I think that's what, what needs to be done with a lot of founders. I think that's what startup studio can be. You can have a goal. But the focus is hard because you're frenetic and you're like, Hey, let me just throw some shit around and see what works here. But once you get people who've been in there, who've done it, and keep you accountable. I mean, we had a, I had a conversation today with a, a with a gentleman Akash, and he uh, <laughs> he didn't mince words. Not in a not in a hey you're an idiot, but a okay. Well, what is this? I'm like he's like nope nope clarity mm-hmm. clarity 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 because it's like slow down get the clarity slow is smooth smooth is fast. So he's like no. So it's really good to have people in your corner who've gone through certain stuff like this, who really understand, hey, listen, you might have these, hey, this person might come in and they want $10,000 as a CRO. And you're like, okay, what are they going to do for you? What, what's, what's their role? What's the clarity of what they're going to execute on? What are their KPIs? Because what I also found, and I think this is wildly important for what startup studios and the program is going to do is there's a lot of resentment that comes from kind of drudging along if i'm being honest and the drudging along and you're paying for it and you're like and i think that's what's so amazing about you and i like i call you my boy like you even you even like hey listen let me do it let's do a probationary period you didn't mince your words man you did not and i think like i think that's what's so hard for people to to do and again maybe i can't wait to get into your background because Maybe it was that ego that that was quieted back in the day through whatever you went through to be like, hey, listen, I know my skill set. I know it really, really well. I also know what I don't know. And like, I know my limitations. If you want to talk to me about X, Y, and Z and digital Mario, but I'll be like, let me call my friend real quick. And, and I think <laughs> we need to know that. And I think what's most important about these communities or what startup students can be is, or will be is, that's that space of vulnerability. Yeah. It's wildly important. Mm. And it, um, so you also bring a very unique perspective as like a solo founder as well, who's building a non-technical solo founder, who's building a tech startup with mm-hmm. amazing partners who, you know, you have built relationships over the years and who you trust to be able to do it. Not everybody has that. And I mean, we we didn't even fall into, uh, you know, the fundraising aspect or anything or, or uh, you know, all the challenges, but uh, it's it's a major testament to like picking yourself up, finding those opportunities, like kind of applying your your quant kind of a, your mind to it, and in that lane. So uh, and, and Thrive Health too. We we um, you know the the two sided marketplace, but I what I find is cool is like the the business and the box element, right? Which is um, there's so many instructors or fitness or wellness providers who are now kind of like. Well, when COVID happened, gym closed down, but then all these other people who don't have facilities anymore and you being able to match them with customers who are just waiting and give them, give both parties a, an easy kind of convenient way to find each other. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a necessary and a valuable kind of service. So um, I'm, I'm excited and, for, for what happens with Thrive. Yeah. I was super excited about it too. I'm not gonna lie. And I think it's, there's one last thing I did want to hit on. You talked about like grit and whatnot. I think also to be really honest, founders need to, and again, I went through an accelerator and, and, you know, Sean, and I think one of the best things with that was it was a, it was, it was kind of a three tier. It was, it was a three prong approach. There's an ABC scenario. One ideation to revenue. Awesome. Awesome. Raj, like quit Microsoft. That's a go, go do it. Second, oh shit, like your MVP now needs scale. Awesome, go. Or, yeah, that needs to go to the pasture. 
we need to put two in the head. It needs to go to the pasture. And I think that's really important because you talk about grit and, and, and kind of stay. And I, I agree with you. You have to. I think it's also really important to honor what pain is. Pain is, is the body telling you something's wrong. It's not working. I had a guy, I was talking to my boy and 14 years into his company. Oh man, I'm, I'm hard. I'm, you, no, man, I'm, I'm, you can't kill me. I'm, I'm, dude, it's been 14 years of pain. That's not grit. That's, that's hubris. That's just hubris to not think, Hey, listen, why isn't this working? Why do you still have the same problem? It's your doubling down in your feet of clay for the wrong reason. Um, so it's a fine line. And again, I think you have to have that network. You have to have that person. You have to have that Seth that can be like, why are you doing that again, Raj? Like, why? Like, is there a per, is there a reason? You know, even our, even I saw these notion notes where we refocus. Hey, listen, that's not working. That's not, we tried it. That's okay, man. I know we spent 90 days or whatever, X amount of dollars on it. It's not working. Let's refocus. Oh, okay. Okay. And I trust you that, no, you mean you, you have my best intention at heart. I trust you that, you know, that we tried to execute him. And I trust you that, you know, that you're not trying to just, you know, run off or whatever. And, and I think, again, I think it's wildly important that, that people at startup studios get that message out there because it's the only thing that's going to make or break you. Oh, yeah, no, and, and we're we're definitely going to be uh, working on on that aspect. So, uh, well, I think that's a good segue into Mad Hat, actually, because so like <clears throat> kind of you know, like theming this this next portion, right? Which is you you're you've decided to jump into this tech startup, like, and and now you're you're starting off in this blank slate. I know for a fact that in Seattle, like, the number of events and the number of communities that you have networked your way into. And the people that you network your way into is absolutely mind-boggling to me, especially in the last like two, two and a half years of COVID. So, so talk us through that because you're a mentor at Founders Institute, you're a mentor at a couple other places. Like how did how did all this happen while you were building the startup too? You know how see, I know public though, but you know how it happened. I pulled the Seth. I went out there and I gave. I just went out there and I gave, dude. Like, don't even, don't pretend like that's not how it goes. I went through those things. I told myself what I didn't know. I didn't know tech. So I went into every single group I could be just to be a sponge, a sponge, a sponge, a sponge. Yeah, you're right. I have a master's in econometrics and quant math. And I've also raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I ran a hedge fund for 12 years. I do have a skill set on that. I have a skill set in finance. And if that's for someone to be like, hey, what do I do here? And I have vertical integrations and strategic partnerships that I know for these, these go-to-markets. And on the investment banking side, I did a presentation, an 18-minute presentation about um, MLPs, Master Limited Partnership. And this is kind of, actually, this was like my real kind of coming out, if that makes sense. I did a presentation about MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships. Master Limited Partnership is basically like a conduit. Um, it kicks off dividends. It's basically pipelines. So in Texas, you've got oil and you shoot oil through tubes. So the tube's going to go all the way to the refinery and break it. And then it's going to go in the gas. Tank. Awesome. But think what I did was I thought about that distribution channel in every aspect of life of business. And I did it in a presentation in front of like 18 people. And they were all heavy, heavy, heavy hitters. Basically, I said to myself, I want to own every piece of these verticals. And then I amalgamated it and I showed it to what Thrive was. So what's our upstream? Our upstream is I'm an oil fracker. I'm one of these big derricks in Texas. I own 600, you're, you're Chef, and you own 600,000 acres of land in West Texas. And that's money. That is just money because that's raw oil. You're like, oh shit, this is your upstream. Man, he's going to go, that's that's its own business. That's Wapiti Energy, that's Exxon, you know, those guys that are literally just getting the oil out of the ground. It's like, okay, how can I own that? that model. I said to myself, NPTI. I know for a fact, I'm going to own who the, the oil is, which was the provider. I did a certification. I said, here's my asset NPTI, which is a national training, personal, uh, national personal training Institute, distribute the CEU and distribute it. And let me make money on this. I'm going to own that asset, 137,000 alumni that they could distribute our assets to. And I get paid on it. Residual, residual, residual. Every time somebody takes a course. These are certified trainers around the united Riders. states yeah. exactly 
So that was my upstream. I made it that way. And that's its own business. Hey, we're franchising, whatever you want to do. Awesome. I said, great. And I was like, ah, I want to own the distribution chain. What's the distribution? All right, the oil gets made and it's now fracked and taken out of the ground. It needs to be transported to refineries that transport its own business. Hey, I'm, you know, Denberry Energy. And all I do is take, or enterprise, you know, Dan Duncan, billionaire, enterprise properties, or enterprise products. All I do is I'm going to take this raw oil. I'm going to ship it for you. I'm going to put it through pipelines. I'm going to put it in container trucks. I'm the distribution channel. It's like, this is my distribution channel. Hey, why don't I talk about a distribution channel of, of property managers? Cool. I know for a fact, they're going to go push this out to me. They're going to go push all my assets that I have, all my oil, all my providers to their end users. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, cool. Like, then I can charge them. I can do a licensing fee. I can do, you know, so that could be its own business. Now, the next level fitness was a brick and mortar where we actually partnered with them and our distribution channel, our pipelines were these static books of business. So that was one of the verticals. What was the third one? The upstream. So you have your downstream, go through midstream, maybe upstream. Okay, now it's going to go into a refinery. They're going to redo it. They're going to turn it into gas. It's going to go in your car and you're going to pay for the gas. And that's another model as, you know, uh, energy side. Okay, cool. Like now I'm going to charge the business in the box. But I'm going to charge the user for using our model. And that's what we're going to match in that. So now I'm going to have a distribution channel and I have to bring that user side of it to the second part of the marketplace. So now I own all verticals. Each one of those verticals is a standalone business. It really is. But I can own all of them and build it in one giant ecosystem. And candidly, if I'm going to own, if and, and I always play 14 steps ahead. And I think that's what's really important when it comes to building, you know, you know, when I got into this network type thing is when I wanted to own every part of the business, I needed to learn a lot. I needed to learn all parts of these verticals. So it's not just one person I talk to great, you're a startup or you're a tech person. I want to know an insurance person. I want to know a healthcare person. I want to know someone in property management. So I literally just started talking to walls. And until the walls talked back to me, I just kept talking and talking and talking. Talk to enough people and one of them is going to start listening to you as well. So I think it was really interesting that you know, I wanted to own them all because I also wanted to be, you know, we have a health insurance play down the road and it's going, but I needed to think to myself, what is that going to take? What's that going to look like? What's that going to be? That's a really, really, really heavy lift. More importantly, if I wanted, if I want to own the ecosystem, what is it going to, what's my output? My downstream has to be something that's not dirty. So you know what it is, dirty data in, dirty data out. How can I own the dirty data in? Screw it. Let me go be the upstream. Hey, NPTI, here's the CEU for them to get on there and blah, blah, blah. But this is how they have to do it. This is how they have to use the app and the platform, i.e. this is how I want the data to be put in so I can own it on the back end. I mean, it just, I didn't know what I was doing. I think business is just that. It's just being busy. So I thought to myself, hey, like, if I want to own the data, what's the best way of owning the data? Let me go to the mouth of the data and start owning it where it goes input. That's kind of how we kind of built the whole thing. And that had that network effect of I had to talk to everybody under the sun and go through the accelerators and have these networks. And candidly, as weird as it sounds, I actually don't like people. I just, I just don't. And I'd rather just be at <laughs> home and just farting in a shoebox. But, um, you know, I had to do it. I had a 36-year network in, in Texas, and we came here and didn't know anybody. Didn't know a single person. And I, I wasn't a business guy. I wasn't in tech. And Seattle is not exactly energy investment making capital of the world. Um, and I had huge black mark, huge black mark. So I think, you know, again, I, if I go back to the metamorph, that pendulum, it was here. I really swung it and, and I burnt. I mean, look, I barely have any hair left. So, you know, it's coming back to the middle. But um, I think what's most important, what, what really was my lifeline and that life preserver, like people like you, the network like you, the groups that not the mentors who said, yeah, I'm a mentor and three times ghosted you. And, and that's that's really disheartening. And I hope, you know, well, I don't hope anything. I know that's not how it's going to be with us. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I'm excited. We're going to be highlighting a lot of people as well and, like, kind of giving them their flowers, too. Um, like today. Be fun. Yep, exactly. So, oh, um, oh uh, again, this was, uh, this was awesome. So, uh, briefly kind of talk about, like, so again, you hit on because you were going through, you know, the, the downstream to the upstream, like, ecosystem, needed all these, like, whether they were tech partners, accelerator programs, or starter programs, or resources and credits. So you're, you're all over the place. You're talking to people, but they see you as an advisor too. 
Right? Like, if you walk to, to the door, like, hey, I'm Raj, I've got Thrive. It but, was weird. Right? It was weird. Like, so t- talk me through a little of that because, you know, I, uh, it, it, the, the short time that we were applying to, like, yeah, accelerator program stuff, like, you knew a lot of those managing directors and whatnot, and they're kind of guiding you, like, oh, you, you just, just you're, you're already in. Uh, so, so, so talk me through how that experience went for you. Honestly, man, I, I think you know how it went because it because it, it was you at it was you as a, at the same way like you did it the same thing. I remember uh, it was I'm gonna butcher it was Kareem it's Karim maybe. Um, K- oh, uh, F- Farid. Farid, dude. When you went to Farid and said, "Hey, here's my guy," he dropped everything. He dropped everything, yeah, and it yeah. was genuine. It was genuine. He brought in another person. Yeah. I think that's how people saw us and me. They're like, Raj isn't, he's too stupid to like steal my wallet while he's hugging me. Like he just is like, the guy doesn't know shit. He's truly <laughs> just like, Hey, I want to learn. I want to help. He has some industry expertise in other places that most people don't have. If I'm being really honest, not too many people understand esoteric derivatives and finance, but it's wildly important doing financial modeling. If you want to talk about, I mean, our boy Chris over at, at the Zig, I mean, he he automated his way out of Goldman. He was so good at what he did. And most people don't understand financial models. So if you sit back and be like, guys, I'll go through financial models all day long as a give, let's go to work. And they're not going to walk away the right people that our network is going to be with just like startup studios. It's not just like a, hey, I'm a take and walk. I think it's a give first. And if you haven't asked down the road, you've given so much. And, and honestly, man, like, I wish I could make, I wish I had some beautiful, romantic, sexy answer like blockchain or NFTs or Web3. Brother, we just give more than we ask for. I think that's really what it comes down to. And, yeah, and like, um, I wish, yeah, like that's it. Oh, uh, uh, that was, uh, so even with Farid, right? Like um, that, that was an awesome example because it, it was literally just like us throwing it out on LinkedIn or something like, hey, we're we're applying to this program. You, is Anybody's out there who, has gone through it or can kind of help us out, we were willing to offer them like an hour or two worth like like paid time. Yeah. Like, hey, just help us through. And he messages me. He's like, bro, you don't need uh, to pay anybody. Um, you know, what? Well, when's your interview and stuff? And we, I think it was like two or three days later, he was like, I got you. Like, I'm free in the next hour. And even though it was like eight hour difference in our time zones too. Like he's Three different times he sat time. with us. Exactly. Three times. Open up the WhatsApp group. It was like tech whenever he he brought in somebody else. Like like that cascading effect, right? Like just don't be a know it all. Be open. Be be just yourself. Be transparent and don't be an asshole. I guess that that's a cardinal rule. So. And I think the cardinal rule too is is a lot of people too. And 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 you actually tell me, hey, stop saying sorry. Stop saying sorry. Like, um, I know for you, it's would you do it for me? And it's unequivocal. Like, I don't even have to ask that. And that's how I know. Like, that's just how I know. And I, I think like when we build networks like that, um, there was a group on Sunday mornings that worked so well. And this is a group now that I meet with on Tuesday mornings. Like it's, it's our, our Sunday morning group was just me. It was in a big Facebook group of like a thousand people. And then uh, I did like, it, we did a Sunday morning startup meeting. And it was basically me literally just saying one time, hey guys, I fucked up a lot in my life. Like I have smacked my male appendage in every door possible. If you have questions on how to not do that or put it in the fan, Sunday morning lets me start with like one person, honestly turned into like 33 people that were religious. And it was like, and these people are crushing it still. It got so much. So I was like, I'm going to like gracefully bow out of this group because I can't keep doing it. Somebody took it over. It was gone in a week. Because they were so much like, like, no, like what? And they started talking about NFTs and they're like, no, we don't want that. Like, that's not the point of this. And it turned about an agenda. And I think what's really important is like communities are hard to build and really, really, really easy to, to destroy. And I think if you go in with the wrong thought process of take before you give, it's just not going to work. And I've seen it over the past two years, three years, four years here in Seattle. I had a business partner and, and she's, you know, she's, she, she was probably single-handedly one of the other people that really got me out of my own way. And, 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 you know, I, she's given more than anybody I've ever met in my life. And 
you know, I'm not her son or her brother or her, her, you know, I'm not part of her family. And yeah. to know that there are people out there who can look at you in the right way and, and really show up for you. If you have that in your corner, you're you just, just start sharpening the knives. It's just time to go to work. And I think that's what startup's going to be. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, perfect segue into Mad Hat then, because you briefly hit on the 33 people that you like th this community actually turned into a lot more than you're making it sound. Yeah, so, yeah. So let, really let's cool. let's kind of dive into that and. Yeah, man. So lastly, you know, to kind of round it all out, um, it just got to the point where I, for 17 months of just well, now, man, now I keep saying 17 months. I was like probably like a year ago, 25, whatever, fucking COVID years. Uh, I mean, my son, who's seven, is still three in my mind. Um, yeah, man. So what basically what happened was. Now listen. I'll call a spade a spade here. It got to the point where it was taking a lot of time. It was just taking a lot of time. I have a startup and I wanted to give and continue to give. Um, so I said to myself, listen, Raj, if you want to do this one-to-one -one giving, you have to honor yourself. And I'll just be really upfront about that. I didn't for a long time. I was the lowest man on the totem pole to myself. And, and I think a lot of people do that. I'm sure you do that as well. And I'm going to project here, but you know, it got to the point where I had to, I had to take a breather. And so, um, so Mad Hatter Accelerator was basically the three years of my life distilled down into seven weeks. Um, so we took it and we literally just did like a course curriculum. It's literally from ideation to revenue, um, anything from financial modeling, Tam, Sam, Psalm, all these things, personas, go to market, product market fit strategies, fundraising, pitch decks, all the things. It was basically what I learned and then applied over the past three years. Um, 33 people have gone through it. Seven of them have been funded now. It was four until about last month. And, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a place where we could give back. Um, there's a paid, you know, there's a paid aspect because I couldn't give you an hour of my time to 33 companies a week if I wanted to run my own hedge, you know, I wanted my own startup. Again, my mom is still the number one goal for me in this every day I wake up in the morning. So I had to be honest about that, but I was learning at the same time. So Matt Hatter Accelerator, uh, which is one of the programs of the startup studio ecosystem is basically, hey, listen, I'm a Microsofter. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, Microsoft, he's thinking when he was talking, we heard it today. He's like, I'm ready to go out on my own. I have this idea. I don't know how to iterate. I don't know how to execute. Like, where am I going? I have this awesome idea. And I'm a seven-year PM at Microsoft. I know what I'm doing, but I'm missing that. I'm missing that gap from ideation to execution. Yeah. And that's that bridge that I thought was the most important. I'm a weird bird. Um, I think I'll be like... If I was going to be a physician, it wasn't orthopedics. Great. You make millions of dollars because you do seven hip replacements in a row. I'd rather be a, a house. I'd rather be some well crazy drug addict who, who looks at the ER, who just looks at problems. I want to solve a problem. Me personally, I love solving the penny gap. I love solving problems. Zero to one is great. Sorry. Zero to a million AR. Awesome. A million, you know, zero to 10 million AR. Awesome. 10 million AR to a hundred million AR. It's like, I'm implementing systems. I'm hiring the right people. I can't tell you that's what gets me up in the morning. I'll just be honest. Obviously, that's when we'll scale and do it the right way and have some extensions and pivots and those vertical integrations. But I think what's really what really gets me going is solving problems and solving problems come in an earlier stage of one. Um, I'm glad that startups can have all types of startup you know programs, but specifically, I think Mad Hatter what it does and under you know rebranding under the startup studios ecosystem. It's going to empower you to take that first step. We'll support you every step of the way. We'll get our CMOs. We'll get our fractionals. But when you're ready, hey, listen, go talk to our guy here. Go talk to our guys here. Here's our ecosystem here. Here's our legal guys here. But to get to that point, if you're stuck, action cures all. But what's that first action? You go through the Mad Hatter Accelerator. No, no, that's a really good point because like, so even at Startup Studios, we're trying to really focus on providing resources to early stage founders, right? So B, C, C, Series A, maybe some Series B companies would, would fit in there. But everybody, like, I was, uh, there was this really interesting graph I was looking at. Um, uh, I think CB Insights just did another, like, updated report on the chances of funding Unicorn at different stages, right? And the, the, the earliest was, um, I think at Series, uh, or at Seed, they had a 3% chance. Of, like you have a three percent shot funding a unicorn, but the higher you go, I think at uh, Series H or Series G, it was like 40 45 percent that you have a unicorn on your head. So 
um, you know, it, it's just interesting. The earlier you play, the riskier it gets. But people like you and me, I feel that's where our sweet spot is because you need somebody who can kind of get in the trenches with you, remove all the naysayers and and the you know the the negative thoughts in your head to be like, it might be possible. Let's just go try it, experiment, iterate, try again, try again until either you don't want to or it works. So um, there, there's think, a few ways out of it. And I think uh, again, I gotta kind of get out but uh, i think the number one thing that i heard from everybody everybody in the accelerator i can't believe you didn't shoot it down i mean yeah if it's not we'll figure it out but like it's so interesting i think people are so quickly to be nascent because they want to have that power over you they want to tell you well i've done it this way for 22 years and let me tell you <laughs> you're an idiot i'm like great <laughs> I get it. The dog has IBS or he's just eating his own poop. <laughs> I understand you've been a physician for 30 years. The dog ate feces. It doesn't have anything. Take the hammer, put it down and go find a drill. Go find a screwdriver. Go find an Allen wrench. Use the right tool. And I think it's really important for startups and founders. You want to talk about burning. You know, and you know this. You know how lonely this shit is? Do you know how alienating and lonely it is? I still feel lonely around my wife because I, I can't talk about certain things. She's like, yeah, I get it, but I don't really care about why you're doing this class for this funnel, for this strategic partnership to do this, to do this, to do this, to do this, because because there's no immediate gratification. I think that's another brutal thing when it comes to startups is you, a majority of the time, you have no immediate satisfaction, none. So where's the cash value and all the shit that I'm doing? I don't know. I don't know. And that's brutally, brutally unsettling. Well, and that, that's kind of the crazy part of uh, of entrepreneurship, right? Where you're 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 kind of not lying to yourself, but you also have to like you see all these little pieces fit into the bigger picture, which is so far away. But yeah. you're you're kind of pushing yourself, like okay, A, B, C, like you know, let, let's yeah. get it brick by brick to make the entire. Thing. And I'll say I'll, one last thing I will say, which I've dealt with firsthand, and it's it's tough. Um, it's funny because I do see the imposter syndrome go the wrong way a lot of the time. And I know you do too. You know, you sell the vision, you sell the story, you sell this. Yeah. Talking is great, but cheap words usually end up being really expensive lies. So that's hard, man. It's really, really, really hard to, to walk that line. Um, and I, I wish, again, I had some great answer to that. It's going to be pervasive and it's going to be there a lot and find a community that'll, that'll give you the space again to be vulnerable enough to be like, fuck, my MRR just got cut in half because I thought this thing would play and it didn't. Not, hey, yeah, our MRR is still growing 27% uh, month over month while I'm pooping in my pants. Yeah. Like, hey, dude, it's okay. You had an idea. Shit, that thing did beauty pass class pass idh ah uh, man hey raj i see the traction i see the thing uh, okay cool hey seth am i doing this wrong hey poke holes in this man poke holes in this because i see it and i'm in an echo chamber in my head and just make sure i'm i'm i'm, I'm on the right path and that's that's what we can do yeah. and that's not that's few and far between mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. awesome man well hey uh wow this is amazing so thank you. I hope you had fun. This is a lot of fun for me. Uh, Where can we hear it so, next? Uh, well, I mean, next one is going to be be mine. We're going to record it later this week, but um, this should be live pretty soon. And um, yeah, so uh, and will first, people be able to find us on the startup studios, or is it going to be a dedicated? You you know where where are we thinking? Yeah, so uh, I mean, everything's going to be linked through the website at startupstudios.co. Um, we're going to do the video podcast or video uh, episode on YouTube itself. So that'll all be organized. Um, and then everything else on Spotify, on Apple, on uh, YouTube podcasts, et cetera, um, wherever you can find it. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you so much. Again, um, I appreciate you sharing a lot and, you know, kind of um, uh, being super transparent. I hope our listeners also uh, kind of understand, like, you know, what 
what you bring to the table, not only on behalf of startup studios, but as as part of the marketplace and this ecosystem that we're bringing. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, th like this is should be a taste for the kind of guests and the kinds of people that we're going to be bringing on. So it's going to be a lot of fun, man. I can't wait to put this all over the place. Hell yeah, bro. Well, thank you again. And to our listeners, we'll see you next time. See you next week, guys. Uh, later.